I want to take God's word and share some thoughts with you. I'm not going to have you turn to any specific passage at this moment, but uh, I will in another. You can turn ahead if you would like to, to Hebrews 1, but I'm not going to start there. I, I want to speak to you about some of the greatest things that we can consider as people. And the first is man's greatest need. I want to talk to you about man's greatest need. But before we even begin, let's pause a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful tonight that we can be together and thankful for your word. We are thankful that we can be together with you. Lord, you are here. And I pray that you will use this time that we have together to just touch our hearts and to speak into our lives and to <clears throat> accomplish the purpose that you have for each individual here. Lord, we all have this great need, <clears throat> and I pray that you will just show us tonight specifically what you are calling us to do in our hearts. Touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I actually was thinking when I thought about man's greatest need, I was thinking about uh, Genesis 3, where the whole human race from the beginning began to unravel and fall apart. And you have those sad words in the last verse of Genesis 23. Let me read them to you. It says, so he, meaning God, he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Of course, we know why. We know that this happened as a result of man's sin. And sin, in the viewpoint of the, the Hebrew mindset, sin is always something that separates people from God. In fact, the first five books of the Jewish Bible that is called the Torah uh, simply relate the fact that it is sin that has destroyed man's relationship with God. And when you go past those five books into the rest of the Tanakh, uh, of the, the Jewish scriptures, we are told that when, when people sin, it cuts them off from God. It creates a separation from God. Adam and Eve were told by God when he placed them in the garden, that they could actually eat anything they wanted. That the Garden of Eden that was their home was a place where they would uh, enjoy pleasure, where they would have great enjoyment. There was only one tree that they were forbidden to eat from. And that tree became the snare, the trap, that the deceiver used to cause humanity to enter into a world of sin. And when they sinned, it caused God to ban them from the garden where his presence was revealed to them. And I would say this, they got what they wanted, but they lost what they needed. They needed God's presence. They got what they wanted, but they lost what they needed. And that is really the story. The story of humanity is that human beings are in desperate need of God because from him flows all that is good, all that is true, and all that is right. All good originates in God himself and it must be maintained in him. Because if it isn't, everything becomes defiled. Everything becomes corrupted. 
There is no option to take goods and uh, have that separate from the presence of God. There is no good away from God. Nothing is good away from his presence. So man's greatest need is for God's presence. But when man sinned, God separated himself from mankind. God cast them out, banished them from his presence, from that garden paradise. That's man's greatest need. Let me tell you something else that, that I would call the greatest. I asked you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, here in this passage, I want to talk to you about, about uh, the greatest word. <laughs> the greatest word, Hebrews chapter 1. And in that uh, chapter, as he opens that, uh, that book to us, here's what the writer says. God who at sundry or at different times and in, uh, and in divers or various ways or manners, he spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Well, that's another way of saying what we have in the Bible is the greatest word. When I talk about the greatest word, I'm first of all talking about the written word that we call the scriptures. In fact, in Psalm 19, the psalmist talks about uh, the scriptures and he talks about the law of, of the Lord. He talks about the testimonies of the Lord. He talks about the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. They're all of the Lord. And the word Lord there in Psalm 19 is all in capitals, which means it's a reference to the specific name of God, Yahweh. The personal name of God is connected with the word of God, with the law of God, because the law is based upon the personal presence of God himself. It was God in his presence that gave the law, that gave the word his instrument of how he supports human life is the word of God. To be compatible with God's desires, we got to know what the Bible says. We got to know God's word. The Bible and the word of God that you have is really an uncovering of the person of God. It's an uncovering of God's face. It's a bearing of God's heart. The word of God, the written word, it, it shows us how we can live lives that reflect him. And that's why the psalmist says in Psalm 19 that God's written word, the law, the commandments, the statutes, whatever, that uh, they are more precious than the finest gold. And that his word is, it's, it's sweeter than the honey that oozes out of the honeycomb. It's the sweetest thing that is known to mankind. Why? Because the written word, if you view it the way it's meant to be viewed, the written word enables you to know God, who he is. The written word is a, uh, it is really a, an understanding of God's presence in our midst. The written word tells us that there is reward for keeping God's word, for keeping God's instruction. And you know what that reward is? It's an opportunity to know God himself. Which leads me to the second verse in Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God has spoken through the prophets, or I would say the written word, because they're not speaking, <laughs> but they have spoken, and it's recorded in the written word. But the greatest word is not just the written word. The greatest word is the living word, because we are told in that second verse that 
in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son, through the Lord Jesus, Messiah Jesus. Jesus is the word of God in a body, incarnate. In the beginning was the word, capital W. And the word was with God and the word was God. John says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only, as of the glory as of the only begotten son of God. He tells us that he is the one that uh, expounds God to us. He opens to our understanding who God is. You remember to be acquainted with Jesus is to know the Father. You remember uh, Philip? Philip said, Lord, if just show us the Father and that would be enough. And Jesus says to Philip in response, have I been with you so long and you don't know the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father is what Jesus says. And he says in his final prayer before his crucifixion in John 17, that this is life eternal, to know God, the only true God, and his son whom he sent. The very Jesus is the very presence of God. That's the point. And the greatest man's greatest need is the presence of God. In the garden, they got what they wanted, but they lost what they needed. So the word, the greatest word has come and that word is not merely the written word that we call our Bible, but the living word who is the Son of God himself, the very presence of God. And there's a third great that I want to talk about tonight. By the way, I've titled this message, The Greatest, because there are several greatest things that I wanted to mention. Man's greatest need is the presence of God. The greatest word, we just talked about that. The third thing that I want to say is I want to speak to you about the greatest gift, the greatest gift. Now, you're probably thinking salvation, and I wouldn't argue with that. But the text that I'm thinking of is Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, and verse 6. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The greatest gift is a hunger. I call it a desire. I think that the best gift that God can give to any person is a hunger for himself. That's the greatest gift. And you know, folks, there is nothing that you and I as people can do to make ourselves hungry for God. You never find God without a hunger in your heart for him. All salvation is from God. But if you will give God a chance as a believer, he will put a hunger in your heart. And if you feed that hunger, God will intensify it and cause it to become a burning passion in your life. I would say that across the years of my life, the most stable thing in my life has been my hunger for God. He's never taken away that desire for him. But instead of taking it away, he, he intensifies it. And so the greatest gift that any of us can receive is a hunger for God. Do you have that hunger in your heart tonight? Or you just have a casual acquaintance with the Lord? I mean, what are you focused on right now? What is it that 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 is a burning passion in your heart? Is it your job? Uh, is it uh, your plans for the future? Uh, is it uh, a desire for a relationship with someone else? The greatest need of every human being is a hunger for God, and it's the greatest gift that God gives to people. I want to say this to you. If you sense that God ever that God is near you, cry out to him. 
If you sense his presence, by all means, call out to him. If you feel God's close, reach out to him. Because at that moment, he's findable. At that moment, he's available to you. If you feel that God's close, if you sense God in any way, you should lunge for him and you should thank him for, hung, for giving you a hunger for himself. Have you ever asked him to make you hungry for him? Have you ever prayed and asked God to intensify your hunger, your desire for him? Have you ever depended upon him to do that in you because you can't you can't make it happen yourself. The greater your appetite for God is, the more of himself he'll give to you. Because a hunger for God is really the promise of his presence in your life. The reality of his presence. That's the greatest gift that God gives any human being. And there's a fourth thing I want to end with tonight. And I call it the greatest possession. And for this, I go back to uh, Romans chapter 6 a moment. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 19, Paul says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. The greatest possession, what would it be? Well, first of all, the greatest possession is that you, as a human being, possess God. You possessing God. The hunger in the human heart for God... <laughs> One of the most awesome realities in human history is to be human, is to seek after God. People are seeking after so many other things because they've lost track. They're confused. They don't recognize what that longing, that gnawing, that hungering deep inside their soul is all about. The fact of the matter is we are told that God has created human beings and he has put eternity in their heart. And there is that eternal longing in the human heart. And so to be human is to have that longing for eternity or the eternal one himself. To be human is to seek God. That's really what human beings want, though they don't know it for the most part. To be human is to seek God. The human heart cannot ultimately be content just to seek God or to know about God. The human heart can only be content when they understand and have the very, when they possess God, his presence. The promise that God gives, not just to Israel, but really to all who will sincerely seek him, is if you seek me with all of your heart, I'm findable. You'll find me. I'll connect with you. I'll meet with you. I'll make my presence real to you. If you really want to know me, if you really hunger for me, I'll come down to your level and I'll meet you. You'll possess me, is what he's saying. You'll find him. The greatest possession is you possessing God. But let me tell you another facet of the greatest possession. Not just you possessing God, but I took you to Romans 6, 19, because the greatest possession is God possessing you. Your heart, in its best moments, longs not merely to possess God, but to be totally possessed by him. And the reason that's the heart cry, really, of a Christian, to be like Jesus, 
to be like Jesus. We sang about it, not I, but Christ. To be like Jesus. That's the heart cry of a genuine believer. I want to be more like Jesus. Well, that, that heart cry of the Christian to be like Jesus is really a heart cry. God, I want you to possess me. I don't just want to possess you. I want you to totally possess me. To be like Jesus, it doesn't matter what denomination the Christian is. It doesn't matter what their theological persuasion is. Christians want to be like Jesus. They not only want to possess God, they want God to possess them. George Matheson, he was a Scottish Presbyterian pastor. He was well-trained in the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Actually, a brilliant scholar and a, and a, a, a gifted preacher. And yet, he had a heart that totally hungered to be God's. He was tired of resisting God. And he wrote this song. And here are some of the words. Make me a captive, Lord. And then... I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword and I shall conquer be. I sink in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms and strong shall be my hand. That's a man that desires to be possessed by God. That's the greatest possession. I want us to bow our heads as we close our thoughts tonight. And as we do so, if you have never before done this, I want you in the, in the quietness of the next few moments, ask God to give you a hunger for himself. And if you've asked God to do that in the past, then ask him tonight to intensify that hunger like you've never had before. Thank God that he has made himself your own, but ask him to totally possess you.